It really is wonderful to actually see people. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've seen some of you. Yeah, mm -hmm. has been a yeah. while. I do wish that we were in the same room and um, shaking hands, giving each other hugs, being able to look <laughs> at each other um, face to face, but this is a beautiful way to be able to gather. And I see some new, new faces myself. and names. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we're learning how to do something we didn't know how to do before. So. <laughs> yes, Jolene, I, yeah. I was kind of hoping you'd wear a hat because yeah. <laughs> for those and, of you um, that maybe don't know where this co comment comes from, we thought about adding some fun element of wearing a crazy hat tonight to our gala. Um, and may maybe we'll do that at a, at a future meeting. Well, I have a crazy hat, and I too. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, look at it. Yeah, we do. Yesterday, wow. I had this like Christmas tree on top of my turkey, and I was wishing the students like happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas giving and just combining. Yeah, it was fun. Oh, and today was ugly sweater day, I think, wasn't it? It was, yeah. We've been wearing some ugly sweaters. We're about to have a build your own care package event on campus um, where the students get to make stuff for finals. And so um, I'm kind of multitasking, making our little sign here for the students to take over. So but I'm excited I get to see all you people and get to do this tonight. It'll be fun. Mandy, you're such a spirit leader. <laughs> Thanks, Amazing. Maria. I just feel like we need to celebrate all the things we can celebrate. And I bring a lot of that enthusiasm. <laughs> Glad to have you here tonight. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think we could begin the process. Uh, Cindy can do a little bit of an introduction. Just welcome everybody. Good evening and welcome to the fall League of Women Voters of the Ripon Area Gala. And we have one every November. Typically, we've had dinner together. And this time, we get to see everyone. But we aren't necessarily having dinner together. <clears throat> uh <-oh. laughs> so we're glad you are all here. There are probably going to be more people uh, joining us as we go along. And I look forward to learning so much about DEI. Thank you. OK. Erin, maybe you would like to introduce yourself as the, the our newest league member and and, uh, and and do a little bit of a introduction of yourself and and an icebreaker. If yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Bailey. Um, I am currently a senior here at Ripon College. I am the newest um, student board member for the League of Women Voters. So um, I am just going to be here tonight. This is kind of like my first event as like a board member. So I'm so excited to be with all of you today. Um, and I, just a little bit about me. I'm a double major in politics and government and communication. And I'm just really excited to be involved with all of you in this community. So my role tonight is to kind of get one acquainted. We're gonna do this, there's a lot of people, which is great. We love to see the turnout. We wanna get everyone kind of familiar with one another, especially because we haven't seen each other in a while. So you're kind of just a good little little icebreaker. When I call on you, just kind of unmute yourself, give us your name and kind of just tell us brief hobby you've been doing during this pandemic. So I'll start first, Ms. Erin. Um, and I have been investing in cooking how to cook during this whole pandemic, trying to get some good adulting before I graduate. So, okay, so our next person up, Rich, do you want to help and tell us a, a hobby or an activity you've been doing during the pandemic? Well, I, I enjoy woodworking and I, I've been spending, spending time using traditional tools as opposed to power tools. Um, I, I inherited some from my grandfather whom I've never met but he was he was an ex excellent woodworker and uh, so I've carried that tradition on and added to my uh, awesome. collection. <laughs> um, Sydney do you want to tell us a little what, what you've been doing a hobby or activity that you've been in quarantine or in, in, in the pandemic? 
Well, I, I, when the weather was nice, I spent a lot of time in my garden. It served a number of, the, uh, uh, you know, it, it helped not only to keep me busy, and I, uh, it, but it also provided food so that I didn't have to go to the grocery store. My efforts now revolve around trying to clean closets, and I don't like to clean closets, so I, I get distracted very easily, but that's my major goal. Perfect. Now let's do the other Sydney. Kind of tell us briefly what you've been doing. What hobby have you picked up? I was just going to say I actually grew up in Ripon and I'm a graduate of Ripon College and I'm the oldest of seven children and I try not to be bossy to the rest. <laughs> we love that. Okay, let's Judy Harris. Uh, one of the most exciting things, and it, it was exciting, is that um, we acquired a puppy in March. And so uh, I have morning walks at about, as soon as it's light, she and I are on the road and we walk for about an hour. Uh, it's been a good thing for my weight. <laughs> I've lost some pounds. Um, and also, uh, like Cindy uh, Ebert, I spent a lot of time in the yard, uh, working on the yard and flowers, and also representing um, the League of Women Voters of the Ripon area on two big projects that took a lot of time. One was a story walk this summer in Watoma, part of the financial wellness committee that I represent the League um, on. And I'm hoping to tell you about that sometime this coming spring. And also uh, a member of the Fair Maps Coalition, the Fair Maps uh, Washera County, which has been hugely time consuming and also very interesting. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Chris. What hobby have you been doing during this pandemic? Um, many actually projects around the house, but uh, my grandson is a senior this year and he's taking calculus. And I wanted to be able to help him with his homework. So I signed on to Khan Academy and took a review of a calculus course which took me all summer, <laughs> but he took his first test and I was able to help him study before the test. Awesome. Okay, looks up next, we have Linda. I think she can't get it. Linda, I encourage you, why don't you go ahead and type in the chat if you'd like, and also if there's anyone else that would rather not share out loud, feel free to, to type in the chat too. Erin, um, you're doing an awesome job. Um, it looks like next, Jolene, you are next. My name is Jolene Schatzinger. I am grateful to be here uh, to be a league member. I also am part of the board this year as well. And so I just want to say, I know that there are some new faces here. And if you're curious at all about joining an incredible organization of both men, you'll notice, and women, even though we are the League of Women Voters, um, I would love to talk with you sometime. What have I been doing? I, it took me a pandemic to take time to enjoy the sunset. So uh, right over on County Road A, Sunset Park, there's this beautiful little park that um, we've just driven over and um, just sat there and enjoyed the sunset. In fact, one time was really special. Um, the presenter tonight who's speaking with us, Maria, we drove separately to be safe from COVID and we both drove over there to enjoy the sunset. And I would encourage you, it was just a beautiful way to, um, we, you know, could talk on speakerphone to each other while being safe and just appreciate nature. So thank you, glad to be here. Love that. Okay, next we have Art. Art, do you wanna tell us what you've been doing during the pandemic? Well, what I've been doing during the pandemic is earlier in the year, we did a lot of chasing around ripping, uh, delivering signs for Biden campaign and others too. And right now, just trying to catch up on uh, yard work and some tree work that I had done and trying to stay calm when I see the uh, ridiculousness of what's going on in our political scene. Thank you so much. Um, Daniela, I think you want to, I know you'll, you'll, you'll get introduced later on, but still kind of give us a little um, hobby you've been doing over the pandemic. Hi, everybody. My name is Daniela. Um, you know what? I started working out. I never worked out before the pandemic, and I was like, I'm not about to be doing nothing. So I'm doing walks, going to the park, lifting weights, and I'm pretty active now. 
awesome. It looks, it looks like, like next up, next up we have Diane. Um, Daniela makes me feel bad because the pandemic has caused me to not be doing the exercise that I usually do. Um, otherwise, I've been unpacking boxes and making lots of fodder for the recycling containers. Awesome. It's good to keep busy. Like I know, I know that's what I've had to do as well. Um, it looks like next up is Janice. Cindy and I joined the meetings together so we don't do that cycle of sound. We're practicing, sir. Social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> During the t uh, pandemic, uh, geez, uh, uh, working remotely with uh, the prisons, uh, I've always been involved, well, not always, but for the last six or seven years uh, with prison ministry, but that's had to go virtual and it's kind of difficult. Uh, so we've, we're doing a program called a Restorative Justice right now, and we write to each other and no, but there's no FaceTime. And with uh, Fox Lake Corrections being like one of the worst prisons in the uh, state right now for COVID, and they don't even get them out of their cells. Um, let me see, the other things were uh, working in the yard and um, <laughs> doing canvas, well, phone canvassing and uh, that's pretty much it, except trying to keep up with cleaning the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. So next we have Lilani. Um, if you want to just tell us one thing you've been doing. I know we all have like lots of things. Let's try to like, just so we can get to the good part of this presentation. Um, well, we bought a trampoline this summer. So I've been doing some jumping with my two-year-old and my 12-year-old. It's a good exercise. Oh mm -hmm. Wow. It looks up next to oh, Carl. Uh, I've been taking advantage of extra time to try to develop my digital art skills on the computer. Oh, nice. Love that. Um, so the next one we have is Sandra. Hi. Um, mainly I've been spending a lot of time doing quilting and reading, working in a garden during the summer. Perfect. Next one we have is Ursula. Hi, <laughs> I'm Ursula Dollinghouse. I teach anthropology at Riffin College. Uh, at the moment, not a lot of free time. <laughs> But my hobby, I would say, is taking care of my house plants. And in the summer, I loved having them out on the balcony. And that was my sanctuary and respite from mm -hmm. being trapped in my home. So <laughs> nice to be <laughs> um, have is Sarun. Hi, I'm Sarun. Um, and one thing I've enjoyed is I've done a lot of collaging um, outside. Awesome. Um, next we have Rachel. Okay. Hi everybody. My name is Rachel. I'm a second year student at Ripon College. And one thing I've been, well, not lately since finals and everything, but um, I like to have little dance parties in my room, you know, put on whatever I'd like and dance like nobody's watching. So yeah. It's a good stress reliever too, dancing. Yep. <laughs> Especially during finals week. Um, next one we have is Mary. Okay. The main thing I've been doing is reading. I made the mistake early in this pandemic to tell the librarian to recommend some books for me. And she and I have similar interests. And she's been, so about every week I get six more books. Some of them <laughs> 500 pages long, many of them brand new books. So I'm getting them before anybody else does. And I feel this pressure to read all of these books. So 
that's what I've been doing. I've been reading. And Leilani, I do have um, the book that you just got the by um, Stacey Abrams. So, but. <laughs> uh, I've been meaning, that, meaning to read that book as well. It looks really, really good. Um, next up is Mandy. Yeah, I'm uh, Mandy and I'm in my eighth year of doing campus ministry at Ripon College. And um, I also got a puppy in March and he is a very energetic golden doodle. Um, and we just spend a lot of time outside finding new parks and trails and lakes and just anything we can outdoors. And I'm trying to get ready to do that even in the winter. So, yeah. So first let's go with Janine. Hi, Jean Sternberg. First of all, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I recently moved back to this area. We were living in Los Angeles for about 35 years and uh, moved back last fall. And um, my mother, um, when she lived in Ripon, was a member of the league as well back in the early aughts, um, as was my grandmother, not here, but in another place. In fact, my grandmother was a suffragette. Um, so I'm getting settled, I'm getting reintegrated um, by profession. I'm a speech language pathologist um, and have a consulting practice and I'm um, just delighted to be here. And Cindy and Rich, um, and we have been friends since the 70s. Um, yeah. Early 70s. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, we're so glad to have you here. Um, next up, we can, um, Judy and Bill. Hi. <laughs> we spend a part of every day walking and um, we're doing some volunteer work. As Rippin Roars, we've been uh, busy with that, encouraging uh, alumni of the high school to support the Education Foundation. And it's been a very busy week if you've seen any of the advertisements for that, which is great. And we've also, we also spent a bit of time working um, as we headed into the election. I was working with the database to try to update addresses and um, to send out letters and postcards. So at least we ended up with a good result at the top level. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all you did with the election. I really appreciate it. Um, so next we have Cal. <laughs> Okay, hopefully we don't get feedback here. Um, we live way out in the country off of a main, off of a side road. So the day-to-day -day pandemic has not affected us much, but I've been doing a lot of um, vacuum of wood. We have an outdoor wood burner, and I spend a lot of time with that thing during the winter. It's good exercise. been doing yard work, and i got to say I've been doing a lot of reading also. Um, catching up and I've, I run into the same thing. I order books and like 15 of them come the same day. And I, I check them all out and try to read them all and try to renew them. But uh, so far I failed miserably, but I will keep trying. Perfect. And last, at least we have our woman of the hour, Maria. Thank you. Um, I think for me, um, it's just catching up on podcasts. I love podcasts. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's such a good skill to have when we're listening um, instead of reading. Um, and that's something that I needed to practice a little bit more. Um, so I've found so many incredible podcasts through this pandemic. Um, this American Life is one of my favorite ones and Oprah Super Soul. Sunday um, podcast is incredible. Um, so yeah, podcasts. We missed Joan, Joan Grows. Well, why don't we just proceed? Um, I guess what we're, Judy, I think it's your, you're up now to Well, it is great to see everybody and hear what you've been doing. Um, we may need to get puppies together at some time, uh, which, which would be fun and rather crazy. Um, what, what I want to do very briefly so that we can move along is, is uh, remind everyone a little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, 
the, both at the national level and at the state level, the League of Women Voters have taken a position on um, these three topics. And they are encouraging individual league uh, groups, no, what do we call us? Uh, whatever, uh, to, to study uh, about DEI and to uh, come up with a statement of how, uh, look at our community and see how each of those topics fits into our community and what we can do to make um, the more inclusive, let's say, um, and, and have more people uh, involved. So I'm looking tonight to work with six or seven of you folks uh, over the next couple of months studying about diversity, equity, and inclusiveness, in inclusion. I always want to say inclusiveness, inclusion. Um, and I think tonight is, is going to be an excellent example of um, what we can learn and what we need to know. And um, I'm hoping that some of you will pick up on that and, and uh, we can start a, a study group and come up with uh, how this will impact our community, what we can do to make it better. And that's all I'm gonna say so we can move along. Can you hear me now, Rich? We can, Joan. You can? Yes, we can. Well, I've been in lockdown here. And just today we got out from lockdown. We all tested negative, but it's been a very slow kind of thing. I've done a lot of reading and uh, watching uh, playing wordscapes on the cell phone. I haven't had much stimulation, however, and I'm looking forward to it, especially tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank Rick, you. I think you also missed Joan Buffetta. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay. Um, no picture there. Okay. I also got a puppy in August. <laughs> it's a miniature labradoodle and she got neutered today. So if I have to leave, I have to go tend to her because she's in a lot of pain. Um, I worked. I've been working through the whole pandemic at Jay's Barbecue, which is my daughter's restaurant and taking care of the puppy and working on political campaign and taking care of the yard. That's it. And I'd love to be part of the diversity study. Okay. So glad to be here. And my, my picture is beautiful. There's no picture that I can see. So I'm actually gorgeous. I lost 50 pounds. And I look absolutely <laughs> The pandemic and no one can know that because you can't see me so okay we're good okay jolene you want to introduce our speaker sure. yes i i will add that um for those of you that are wondering why we are looking at doing a study group uh something that i've really admired the league of women voters on is that we are one of the main groups that we locally, we, we delve in depth into studies. We look at our local area. The league has been instrumental in looking at transportation issues. This is one of the reasons why we have a Ripon taxi here in Ripon. We looked at water quality uh, in the area. We, we are, have done a study on poverty. And what we do is then we take a look at these issues. We bring in local people to really help us understand it deeper. And then we come to consensus and offer suggestions for policy. This is very different than the majority. Um, and so for those of you that are thinking, you know, I'd like to get involved with a group of people locally that are looking at some of these issues in a, in a non-partisan way and in a way that moves our community forward, it's just wonderful. And so tonight embodies that. I can't think of a better person when we look at the breadth and depth of an understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I first met um, our presenter tonight, Maria, um, a little over a year ago, I believe, was it, uh, Maria? And uh, she came to us from California. It was one of the first uh, times she had seen snow. Uh, I've been out here in Wisconsin. And um, since then has just been instrumental at Ripon College, working with the Diversity Coalition with students, with um, helping to raise the voice of, um, you know, uh, perhaps sometimes un underrepresented voices. Um, 
um, she received her bachelor's from San Jose State University, uh, her master's from New, New College of California, and is currently working, correct, on her PhD uh, in the Graduate School of Leadership and Change at Antioch University. I encourage you, I don't know if she will get to go into it tonight, but it would be really uh, insightful to have a deeper conversation with her about some of her personal research that she's doing. Um, she has invited some students from the college who will also provide us some insight. And I also just want to set the tone for our meeting here is that in my experience um, of the League of Women Voters, we come to this space in a place of willingness to learn, willingness to, to listen to each other. Um, and so we are so grateful that you have all, uh, our presenters tonight, are taking your time and energy to help us come together and learn. So with that, Maria, I know you, you will, I invite you to say more about yourself uh, and to introduce the students that you've invited as well. And please maybe join me in doing a little clap if we can, or just putting your hands like this. How about to welcome to welcome you? Thank you, everyone. It's it's really great to be here. Um, muchas gracias, Jolene. I, I forgot to actually say your official title. Maria is the Director of Multicultural Affairs for the Center for Diversity and Inclusion at Ripon College. And I will also say that there will be time at the end for questions. So we look forward to having you join us with, with anyone with, with questions afterwards. Thank you, Jolene, for the kind um, introduction. Um, before I begin, I wanted to do a recognition of the native land um, as is our tradition at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. Um, we represent uh, many different walks of life and um, I would like to take this moment to honor our native land and recognize, recognize the 12 First Nations that reside in the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. Among them, the nations of Ho-Chunk, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Menominee, Mohican, Oneida, and Brothertown. We honor their history of resistance and resilience to give us a sacred space to share with you today. Um, today, I'm also joined by three amazing young women leaders, each with their own narrative and set of dreams for a better future. They will be joining me in a short moment uh, for our Zoom table talk discussion on their own civic engagement journeys. Thank you, Sairun, Daniela, and Rachel for sharing the space with me today. A little bit about me, uh, as Jolene me mentioned, I am the Director of Multicultural Affairs in the Center for Diversity and Inclusion here at Ripon College. I have just moved this past year, um, January in January. I moved from San Diego, California, which is why you see pictures of the ocean and the Santa Monica uh, Pier um, in, in Los Angeles. I am uh, an LA girl all the way, a Cali girl all the way, and I am enjoying my time here in Wisconsin. I'm the Director of Multicultural Affairs in the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, and I, I moved um, to Wisconsin from San Diego. Uh, I am the daughter of Salvadorian immigrant refugee parents, and my ancestors are the Nahuat Pipil, a people of the coffee plantations within the volcanic lands uh, in El Salvador. My husband of 24 years, Edgar, is from Mexico City and serves as, has served as a teacher and now a vice principal in a predominantly black and brown community in Barrio Logan, San Diego. I have dedicated the past 15 years in the higher education to make sure that strong foundations exist for the wellness and retention of college students who are historically underrepresented, as I am as well myself. I'm also a first-generation college student, and I hold an Associate of Arts degree in Interior Design, a Bachelor's degree in Art and Photography, a Master's in Humanities and Leadership focusing on servant leadership, and recently, literally two weeks ago, I received a Master's in Leadership and Change and reached candidacy for this doctorate program um, in leadership and, leadership and change from Antioch University. 
focusing on culturally compassionate intellectualism, which stems from the work of Paulo Freire, which encourages scholar practitioners as myself to co-create and involve our students with, with pedagogy design and motivate them through intellectual curiosity, service learning and leadership. A little bit about the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, I am hoping that you are able to, um, to certainly see our, our beautiful pictures here of our, of our, of our CDI Center. Um, my job entails many duties and responsibilities, among them advising and supporting students of color and first generation college students coming to Ripon College from the greater Wisconsin area. In addition to crossing state lines, our students come nearby from Illinois and as far as Texas, Mississippi, and California. My work also extends to find resources for our international students from Pakistan, Ghana, India, Kashmir, Venezuela, Jamaica, and South Africa, among other countries. The CDI advises nine diversity coalition groups including the Black Student Union, Amnesty International, La Unida, Asian Student Association, and the Queer Straight Alliance, which supports our LGBTQIA communities. I am joined by a wonderful team of student interns who work in our area as peer cultural educators in order to design cultural programming that educates the campus community on various social justice topics and celebrations that help our students feel a bit closer to their cultural traditions. We invite you all to visit us on Facebook, our social media plug, and our physical space located in Bartlett Hall, of course, during, during safer times, where you will find a comfy, comfy lounge with media outlets, a study room, an extensive art supply closet for healing and therapeutic arts, a display of flags and artifacts around the world, a mini food pantry, but most importantly, a safe space for robust conversations that support all students in their journeys towards identity development, career preparation, and <laughs> thinking. I'd like to start with a quick review of some terminology uh, since you are gearing up to uh, get your committee together. And so I hope that some of my notes and some of the information that I present here uh, help support some of that foundation. Um, and so I'd like to touch upon race and ethnicity first. Often they are argued to be social constructs that are used to categorize and characterize seemingly distinct populations. You see, when we think about race, we think about distinctive physical traits that set us apart from another. And when we think about ethnicity, we think about a broader definition of large groups of people classed according to common racial, national, tribal, religious, linguistic, uh, or cultural or background. Continuously throughout a sometimes uncomfortable and tragic US history timeline, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color have experienced the power and disempowerment, disempowerment of both. Racial bias and ignorance has fueled social exclusion, discrimination, and violence against people from certain social groups as we have currently seen in the news this year as well. One example that I can give you today is the way that schools around our own communities are sometimes resourced and funded. One has to think about racial bias when black and brown children don't have a functioning drinking fountain to quench their thirst or therapeutic art outlets um, and surround, they are surrounded by community food deserts, or they don't have access to culturally competent and committed teachers who can share their linguistic and, linguistic and cultural capital towards their academic success. 
All of these are barriers sometimes. In turn, racial prejudice confers social priv privilege to some and social and social and physical disparities to others and is widely expressed in hierarchy, hierarchies and patriarchies that privilege people with white skin, especially white men in society over people with darker skin colors. On the other hand, uh, people who share an ethnicity may speak the same language, come from the same country or share a religion or other cultural belief or expression. As we explore the politics of race, the United States government recognizes this distinction between the concept of race and ethnicity and sorts individuals as white, black or African-American, Asian, American Indian and Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander or quote unquote other. It also recognizes two ethnicities, Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino. A quick review of diversity, inclusion, equity and equity. Moving forward, the concept of dimensions of diver diversity moves us beyond tolerance. I'll repeat that. Diversity moves us beyond tolerance. Diversity encompasses acceptance and respect. Diversity highlights dimensions of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, physical abilities, religious beliefs, political beliefs, or other ideologies. It is the exploration of these differences that need to happen in safe, positive, and nurturing environments. Diversity is a reality created by individuals and groups from a broad spectrum of demographic and philosophical differences. It's extremely important to support and protect diversity because by valuing individuals and groups free from prejudice, we can foster a climate of equity and mutual respect. In the context of higher education, when we look at inclusion, it inspires involvement and empowerment, both in and outside of the classroom. The inherent worth and dignity of all people are recognized through inclusion. An inclusive university promotes and sustains a sense of belonging. It values and practices respect for talents, beliefs, backgrounds, and ways of living it, of its members. Despite being very similar words, equity and equality have very different implications in practice. The two are not interchangeable. So it's crucial to analyze social issues through a careful lens. It is a particular problem, a case of inequity or inequality. In order to avoid confusion and the risk of appearing misinformed, be sure to identify whether equity or equality is the end goal of your social action. Equity is favorable in situations where systemic injustices place populations on an uneven playing field. For example, African Americans have historically faced discrimination in areas such as access to employment and higher education. White Americans are often given preferential treatment in hiring practices and college admissions. Some affirmative action policies attempt to diminish these inequities, requiring that businesses make hiring decisions based on relevant qualifications rather than race, gender, identity, and other statuses. Such policies aim to raise historically disadvantaged populations to the same starting point as the historically advantaged, distributing the resources to do so in an equitable manner. As you can see in this image, equity is also slated to provide a form of, so, of, of justice and a form of recognizing what justice could look like. And so as you can see on this image, 
equality versus equity looks very different. We can all give all three of these characters uh, the box to look at the game, but can they have access equally to see the game? Well, equity on the right, on my right hand side, side at least, is showing us that the character in a wheelchair needs a ramp in order to be able to watch this game. The young lady on this image needs two boxes to be able to reach that fence. Intersectionality. Here is a term that then places us not only in one location or one sort of identity, but multiple identities. Intersectionality coined by Kimberly Crenshaw describes the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given, um, as they apply to a given dimension of interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Therefore, we are not monolith monolithic individuals. We are intersectional. Last but certainly not least, 100 years after the 19th Amendment, the fight for women's suffrage continues. Clearly, women were given the right to vote, yet the fight was compromised when it's inception by a narrow vision of who should benefit and who could be left out. The white suffragists who gained the vote were willing to do so even though many women of color who faced additional racism fueled barriers such as the proliferation of Jim Crow laws effectively could not enjoy the same opportunity. The dichotomy of professing a commitment to equality while embracing the privileges of exclusion, however, was not unique to the debate of women's suffrage. It reflects a larger reality that while women have made important gains, these gains have not always been evenly experienced. And through it all, we see progress. African-American women, such as the writer and orator Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, the community art organizer, Juno Frankie Pierce, the journalist Josephine St. Pierre Raffine, Elizabeth Piper Ensley, Ida B. Wells, and Barnett, who championed both suffrage and civil rights. Native American women, such as Suzette Lafleche Tibbles and Sikala Sa, a queer woman like the poet Angelina Weld Grimke and the educator Mary Burrell. Latina women like Jovita Idar, who protected her family's newspaper and the rights of Mexican Americans, and Asian American women like Mabel Ping Wali, who led thousands of marchers in a 1912 suffrage parade in New York. They all fought for the vote as part of a broader struggle for equality, but their stories are, are not nearly as well known as they should be. Today, we can see a modern day civically engaged woman, many at that, who are ready to serve this country within their full rights as American citizens. I hope some of these women look familiar to you. One of my biggest honors in life is certainly meeting Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor during her My Beloved World book tour. Thank you. And now I'd like for us to hear from our young women, our future. I have invited these women to participate in this panel discussion with three guiding questions. I'd like for them to introduce themselves because narrative is important and we need to own our narrative. Cyrum Bruner, Daniela Munoz, Rachel Sims, I'm honored to share this space with you today. 
Your guiding questions have been given to you prior to our session today. You will be telling us a little bit about yourself and your background. You're going to, um, our next one guiding question will be to share a short narrative, walking us through your first time voting. What was important about your vote? And the third guiding question is, what issue in your community engages you civically? And what can we do to support this issue? can go in that order, Cyrun, Daniela, and Rachel, we will, we can address the very first one. Um, tell us about yourself and your background, cultural education and career goals. Let's put your dreams out there. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'm also having some struggles with Zoom. It's always hard to run on my computer, but um, it looks like it's working out. Um, so I'm Cyrune Bruner. I am in Madison, Wisconsin right now. I'm not in Ripon, where it looks like a lot of you may be. <laughs> um, and I'm a freshman or a first year student at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Um, I know Maria from my mom, actually. That's our little connection. Um, they knew each other in California. But um, so in terms of ed my educational and career goals, I'm right now majoring in environmental science and policy. And I'm hoping to kind of put this education towards learning more about tribal law and tribal land management um, in the US. And I'm also really interested in access to food. Um, in terms of my past, I worked at the Dane County Rape Crisis Center for five years, and a lot of that work has really um, fueled how I feel about current events. Um, also, I learned so much, and it's really charged me to really feel a huge commitment to my community and to wanting to um, help others around me and also fight sexual assault and um, sexual abuse prevention. Um, Yes. <laughs> so um, just from that background, that kind of funnels into um, my narrative for the first time I was voting. Um, the first time I voted was in this past presidential election. And that was a pretty exciting moment for me. I felt really proud, um, even though I couldn't go to the actual um, the like voting booth um, and I didn't get a sticker. It still felt like a really, really big personal moment. I did it all myself. My parents didn't help me at all. And it just felt like this huge monumental thing that I guess has always been talked about. Um, and I'd never had that experience before of actually feeling like I had um, a tangible um, way to influence politics and the world around me. Um, in addition, with everything going on in the political climate right now, I felt really charged to just fight for things that I'd been learning about throughout high school and through my job opportunities, um, especially at the Rape Crisis Center. So that was something that really made me feel super passionate about my vote. Um, and then in terms of uh, an issue in my community that engages me civically, um, like I said, I'm very involved and passionate about um, work with the Rape Crisis Center and like Maria kind of discussed how this work um, on something that seems really focused on one certain identity is really intersectional with several different identities. And that's something that fascinates me and that I really want to learn more about how different social justice issues, including poverty, access to resources, including healthcare, um, also kind of intersect with um, violence prevention. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much, Cyrun. Appreciate your feedback. It sounds like you're a very busy young uh, woman, first year of college and doing all that. Wow, amazing. Next is Daniela. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Daniela Munoz. Um, I am Mexican American. I was born and raised in San Diego, which is where I met Maria. Um, many years ago, probably like 
2012-ish. Um, I, I obtained a bachelor's in sociology from UCSD. Um, and I'm currently a student at the University of Michigan doing my master's in social work. Um, I would like to become a licensed clinical social worker uh, working in a research setting, preferably UCSD, which is where I've been working for seven years now. Um, I started there as a student and I'm now uh, have been working there three years post college. Um, um, the first time I ever voted was actually in the 2012 presidential election. Um, I remember like not knowing much in terms of how to register or go about it, but I remember I was like, I have to figure this out because there was like so much talk going on about, hey, like we could potentially have the first African American, uh, the, the second, Afri the sorry, Barack Obama be reelected again. So I was like, I definitely want to be a part of that. Um, so I, I made sure that I figured out how to vote. Um, and then what issue in your community engages you civically? Um, I've been working in HIV research for seven years now. Uh, I've been trying to understand uh, what people living in HIV go through throughout their lives, um, such as in immediate and long-term long medical issues and psychological issues as well. Um, so this is an issue that I've been passionate about for, again, the last seven years. Um, and current, I've been more involved in like the medical research, um, but after I get my master's in social work, I wanna go back and still work in HIV research, but work more closely with individuals and their experiences. Thank you, Daniela, for sharing. Appreciate your time with us from California. And Rachel. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to you all for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, as said, my name is Rachel Seams, and I'm from Round Lake Beach, Illinois. It's um, a suburb about an hour north of Chicago. Um, I'm the youngest of three children, and I am a first-generation uh, college student. I'm studying psychology as well as Spanish with the hopes of going to law school um, with a focus in immigration law. So this year was my first time voting since I'm only 19. Um, I remember I didn't really have a vast knowledge on the process of voting. However, um, with friends around me and social media at my fingertips, I figured it out. Um, I did vote um, through mail-in since I am an Illinois resident. Um, I was debating whether to vote as a Wisconsin resident or not because I knew that was an option. Um, but this year, unfortunately, um, my friend lost her brother at the hands of the Round Lake Beach police. So um, this election was much more important to me um, locally because um, some of the leaders that we look to for um, guidance and um, to take this case seriously did not. Um, so we actually held a Zoom meeting with various community leaders and um, candidates that were running, asked them our questions, um, really researched um, into who our local leaders were and what their dealings were with and the candidates that could possibly be replacing them. So I mailed in my ballot and thankfully we um, actually voted out some of the leaders that we were looking out. Um, to vote out. So this election was very a very positive experience. I'm glad that I did that and I will continue to do so. Um, and then uh, community, um, what issue in your community engages you civically? Um, right now, it does have to deal with um, police brutality as well as um, the issues at the border. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about this year. It's so I'll start a little bit with Rachel. You talked about immigration um, and these issues at the border. What are some of those issues that you're alert alerted to um, at the border that you're learning about or that you're finding some passion around to advocate for? So yeah, um, my town is actually primarily Hispanic. So I um, do know many people who committed and just getting, um, getting more inf information on how do you even apply to be an American citizen and 
And there's so many things that go into it more than I think a lot of people like to say, oh, just get in line like everybody else. But what, for my understanding, there is no line. And it's important that we look into who our leaders are and who wants to be in these positions that they're going to help people be able to get in that line. Um, and also just helping with people at the detention centers. I think a lot of people think that what's going on isn't really what's going on, but um, it's happening and children are in cages and people are separated from their children and it's not okay. So yeah, it's basically just hearing narratives and listening to people because there's power in narratives and there's power in listening and being quiet while people actually talk to you and actually listening and taking it in rather than just hearing people, so. Thank you, Rachel. I love your passion. Syru, can you just share with us a little bit about um, your interest in helping women? It sounds like you are helping some of the most vulnerable of women. Um, and how did that sort of start up for you? Yeah, so um, I first began working at the Rape Crisis Center when I was a freshman in high school, and that was mainly because I had always been really passionate about topics and about justice, but I didn't really know much, and I wasn't super confident in my knowledge, and so I took that opportunity to become a lot more educated. The program is like, it's a youth advisory board, and it's mainly educational. It's bringing in a lot of different speakers to like you, like Rachel and Maria, you've talked about um, listening to other narratives. It was, it's really about that. And that's been something that's really, um, I think broadened my horizons and completely taught me about um, how intersectional this, this issue is. Thank you. Speaking of intersectional, Daniela, you alluded to um, working with HIV patients um, can you share with us uh, a little bit about, you know, how that work sort of moves and informs you um, to then be able to communicate some of that information to the community for, um, for, for, for more equity work, you know, in, in, in support of HIV patients? Um, so something I noticed while we're throughout the years that I've been working in HIV work is the lack of understanding for our minority groups that are HIV positive. Um, I would have research participants that would come in from all walks of life. And the level of understanding of what it meant to be HIV positive was completely different for um, Mexican Americans or African Americans. Like it was a completely different world, right? For um, a white American as opposed to a Mexican American. Um, like for example, my Mexican American participants, like their families wouldn't even know that they had HIV. It was like a whole different, like, like I'm, I'm, I have to take my medication in private, like they can't know. And I think like reducing that stigma and like helping people like from my community um, kind of go about it is what's made me go into social work as well and go back into that research setting and really be a voice for, for the minorities living with HIV. Thank you so much, uh, young women. It's, it's such an honor to be here with you all. Um, for everyone in the audience, this is really what happens at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. Rachel, who's one of our um, student volunteers um, is part of sometimes a very robust set of conversations here at the center. Uh, we talk about immigration all the time because of her passion uh, for immigration law. Um, but um, we just wanted to give you a little glimpse of what that could look like when perhaps you have your own conversations, when you are leading a conversation or facilitating a conversation um, that engagement piece um, is very important and narrative is, is, is even more crucial because everybody has a story and we need to be able to, um, I think, have more spaces where um, more diverse groups can tell their stories. Um, the last thing I wanted to share on the share screen is just a quick list of some resources 
um, that uh, I researched recently. And, you know, the, these are just three organizations out of so many different organizations, um, specifically to, the, to your group here with the League of Women Voters. Um, I think for me, what stands out is that they each have sort of their different focus on, you know, the Brennan Center focuses on voting reform and uh, all voting is local, uh, focuses on, you know, eligible citizens who are in jail. Um, NAMI, which is an, a national organization um, as well, uh, focuses on men mental wellness. And I know that we continue to discuss these issues, but this is intersectionality. This is how um, voting um, and some of these issues in some of these communities continues to be very important. Um, one of the things that I honestly, when I was researching a little bit more about this is um, we do often think about mental illness and mental wellness um, for our students, but um, who is providing those, that type of information when it's time to vote, when it's time to register? Um, and I think that, that NAMI is doing an incredible job. Um, they all are. Um, and the last slide I wanted to share with you is my contact information. If you need to get a hold of me or any of these wonderful, amazing young women, um, I'd love uh, to connect. Um, we are uh, available anytime if you need to continue to have a conversation. Uh, and I think we'll take any questions from the audience at this moment. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I'm a I'm a visual learner in many ways, and the cartoon, let's call it, that you had be showing equality and equity is a picture in my mind of of the difference between the two. I have to have that picture <laughs> rather than reading the words about it. And so I appreciate your presenting it here. And I think that that one of the things um, we need to take into consideration when we're, we're studying this is that people do learn in very different ways and and how we can it, it, people communicate in very different ways. Um, I think that diversity part is where personally I need to to start and and then move on to the other sections. I think there's just a lot to be learned with diversity and the way people learn. Absolutely, Judy. I threw out a lot of terminology, so please don't feel that you, you know, being a person of color myself, we, you know, Daniela and I have had these conversations. It's almost like we take some things and we just do them. This is our cultural norm. This is our, this is the way we sort of, um, uh, we exchange language, right? And so we code switch a lot. I know Daniela and I often code switch when we talk with each other. Um, but I think it's understanding those nuances. So I, I appreciate your um, comment that visual learning is also very important. Um, I know that I'm a visual learner. So, you know, I'm hoping that I spoke to some of you in that sense as well. Um, I'm also in, it's with these podcasts sort of more in terms of auditory learning, right? And so you're right, Judy, everyone is different and learns differently. And so I'm glad that that spoke to you. And I think that being vulnerable enough to say, I don't understand everything, but I want to learn is really the, the, the key and the starting point to that and not being afraid to ask any question that you have um, is also important. However, it's important for us to provide safe spaces to do that. Because I think that that is where it gets muddy and it gets tricky and people begin to make assumptions about others. And, um, and so I, I think that more spaces like these need to exist for us to have these open and honest conversations.
Great, thank you. Code I, switching, I... Um, Jolene, code switching means um, it's when Daniela and I were bilingual, we will code switch from Spanish to English. Um, people who speak other languages immediately just code switch from, you know, uh, a foundational language to um, a more general um, English language. So, um, you. And I, I would encourage uh, anyone, if you have a question, please go ahead and either write it in the chat or go ahead and just, um, you know, raise your hand, un unmute yourself. You can hit the space bar to unmute yourself as well. Uh, this is a time to ask any question. Okay, I'm trying. Okay. Um, Maria, you've come from LA or, or Southern California. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, Daniela, you're also from Southern California. You're now in Ripon, Wisconsin. I would say that there's probably just a few differences between where you came from and where you are. In what suggestions would you make if we were going to go forward to help ease some of the tensions? Just for example, the Black Lives Matter incident and the sign, the signage in Ripon, and the, um, the the tension and the stress that was felt by different groups in this small community. My personal belief is a lot of it comes from a lack of experience and it comes from fear about not knowing about different um, ethnicities and different uh, traditions and things. But what, what would you suggest to us as a group, how we can start bridging some of these uh, barriers? Um, you, you know, Ripon College is kind of like an island uh, of idealistic ideas surrounded by a sea of people who don't necessarily want to hear those ideas. So what would you suggest that we do to help get out there in the community and um, just get rid of some of the fears that people have? Thank you. Thank you, Joan, for your question. I think you've just addressed that yourself and you sort of answered it yourself. And um, I think a lot of times within our questions is really our answer. And um, in terms of directly answering that to you, um, it really takes, it takes all of us. I mean, that is just my own personal view. That is how I do my work, is how I um, educate a predominantly white institution such as Ripon. Um, I work with a wonderful team of um, faculty, students, staff, uh, community leaders. And, and so I also have to step into spaces where perhaps I'm not too sure about many times as a woman of color, um, but I'd also uh, encourage you um, if you're white to come and step into some of our spaces. I think that that really is the key to bridging and to understanding each other narrative, I can't emphasize that enough, is, is so very important. Um, and um, being able to ask questions, share space, build community. Um, yes, it's contentious. Black Lives Matter means many different things to many different people. Um, at the end of the day, you all saw that Ripon advocated to keep the Black Lives Matter mural uh, with so much advocacy behind it and so much controversy behind it. I think I rarely watch the news, but I remember turning on the news during the summer and, and saying, that's my that's where I live. And uh, y'all were all over the news. Um, and it, it was controversial, but that needs to happen as well that sort of tension and uh, challenge and uncomfortableness needs to happen in order, in order for us to then move to the next phase. How, what that looks like, um, think about your own context, think about the, uh, the spaces that you occupy socially, but it really begins at home with your family, with your conversations among yourselves, right? And so, mm -hmm. I think that it's dimensional, Joan. It, it's not one recipe. It's what works here at Ripon. 
it's what works in your community. It's what works in your family. It's going to look different everywhere, even in California, where you would think, and Daniela alluded to this in her work with HIV, HIV patients that are Latinos, um, you know, sort of conquering that stigma with conservative um, Mexican American or Latino groups um, who have a very hard time accepting the LGBTQIA plus community because of conservative thought, uh, backgrounds, religion, et cetera, et cetera. So it happens everywhere, um, but bridging is, is very important. And I think when you say bridging, I think that's a very important uh, word to keep in your pocket. And, and my guest speakers, please help me if you have anything to add as well. It, 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 just a comment, it, it appears that um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and is, is a very nuanced concept. Uh, it, and, and one, you know, try to nail it with three words, but you know, so much of our political scene is all down to one, uh, you know, one catchphrase and that sort of thing. So the, the study of this really works counter, counter to the tendency, the human condition to synthesize things down to just, just one, one key point. Because really to explain this is, is to be open to a lot of different um, visions of an individual, for instance. I mean, you know, they may be, they may be black, they, a woman, they, you know, a single mother or uh, uh, happily married, um, you know, but, but so many things have, have impacts uh, what they're interested in, you know, it seems to me that I do best, uh, in, in, you know, cause I live primarily in a white culture, uh, you know, I get very nuanced in relationship to the, the other people in the community that I know that are white, you know, so, you know, that they, they, you know that individual has a different political stance, and and I can I can pick up on that nuance. I think it's easy for me to to if it's a Hispanic individual to generalize so much more. So it it because because of my experience is more limited with a diverse group of Hispanic individuals, for instance. You know. So I think it is a really complex, uh, you know, way way of looking at this. Although we've got, you know, three key words here. I mean, when you mix it all together, it's really, really a complicated mix. Right, and it also leads us to think about, you know, once we sort of identify and define those within our own spaces, within our own context. It's then taking us to justice and liberation. Those are other two key words that come with diversity, equity, inclusion is now there's a lot of research showing that we need to look beyond that. There's argument even against the word diversity that it should just be justice and liberation. And, and so um, I think continuing to ask questions, learning, um, having these sort of spaces is going to continue to be very important. I would, I'm wondering if our students can share more about um, giving us some inspiration about our future study. So here we are, uh, embarking on a study on diversity, inclusion, and equity. And perhaps you can give us some inspiration for what questions do you wish we would be asking in our community here in Ripon related to this? Or perhaps um, 
Why do you think, in your view, is it important for a group like the League of Women Voters in the community to be exploring this from your perspective? Uh, perhaps um, if there's a personal experience of something you saw uh, a community organization do or an idea or um, I guess it's open minded, but I wanted to hear more of your thoughts to give us some inspiration as we embark forward on this study. Hi, yeah, I think um, when I thought about this, I thought it was great that you guys were all letting us speak and everything because I know that there's a huge um, generation gap going on. I think a lot of times parents and grandparents don't really allow their grandchildren or children to really speak their minds. So I think um, just like community engagement and reaching out to, you know, not even just college students, but maybe Ripon High School, the um, middle schools, just kind of getting their minds generating, um, just bouncing ideas back and forth um, in an open space. I think there's um, beauty in that. Um, also, when it comes to the League of Women Voters, also including women of different backgrounds, I know um, there's a huge thing where, yes, we got the women's suffrage back in 1920, but a lot of times people forget the right to vote for Black women or Hispanic women were often ignored and um, we struggled to fight for that. So yeah, just basically including other people of different backgrounds and as well as different ages, I think would be very important um, in your guys' study going forward. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I really liked the, um, just this focus on kind of bridging gaps and also like, I think we kind of talked about before this, um, it's really easy to try and only um, expose yourself to situations that are comfortable um, and it's hard to be vulnerable, it's really scary. And I think that's something that um, is really admirable um, that it feels like you guys are really pushing yourselves to do even by having us come in um, and really listening to us. Um, I think that's something that um, will definitely help as you move forward, especially in asking questions to these different groups in your community. Um, in terms of questions, you mentioned what questions you would ask. Um, I would say asking people where they come from and what their experiences are. Um, it's very important to understand that all the students are there, but they didn't all go through the same things to get there. And I think just taking time to really understand all those struggles and hurdles that they had to go through to get there. I think it's very interesting to talk with your parents or grandparents about their heritage and um, how that impacted their families, perhaps when they left Europe and came to America, for example. Um, my, one of my grandmothers did not want my mother to marry my dad. She said he was black Irish. And I remember as a child just being really flabbergasted that my grandma would say that. So it is interesting when you, when you remember what you do know about your family and your friends. Uh, I have my pen handy here to write down names of people who might be interested in participating in this study. So if anybody wants, besides uh, Joan, who already committed herself, anybody wants to jump in, let me know and I will put you on the list. I'll do that. Mary. Okay, got it, Mary. Thank you. And I have a question in terms of diversity, because it seems to me that as a country, we've become more and more polarized and people are staying more and more within their own tribe, so to speak. And, you know, people, I, I don't see it. I mean, I see this as a really white community. It's really hard to even meet people that are that are not of that, um, the, you know, different races, different religions. But, and also just, it seems to me people are just digging in more and more with their own their own group of people. And I don't know how you, I wonder how you bridge that. I think it's an also understanding, Mary, that's a very good question. Um, it's understanding 
some of the background, as Daniela mentioned, you know, why, what is the narrative behind it? What is that story? Um, what are some of those barriers? Um, oftentimes, communities of color um, do isolate themselves, um, but it's for, I mean, I wouldn't make assumptions on all communities of color, but oftentimes it's survival. Oftentimes it's um, immigration status. Um, there is a lot at stake uh, for people of color. Um, we have students who have shared here in my office that they don't feel, you know, African-American males, they don't feel comfortable running, taking a jog around Ripon. And, and so what does that say about our community here in Ripon? Uh, what, what, what access do you have to those stories? And I think that this is an opportunity to have greater access to those stories so that perhaps you never really thought about it. There are things we just continue to do. And, um, but for me, learning about my students here is learning about their barriers. It's learning about some of their challenges. Going to Webster's may not be as easy for some students of color. Just going to Webster's for bananas, you know? And, and so what does that say again about the Ripon community? Um, are we doing our part to speak to some of these young people when we do see them at J's or we see them at mugs, uh, we see them walking around. Um, I think that that's also very important. Um, are we welcoming them? Um, there's always a very nice message, I think, from the Ripon district that comes in for students um, through Facebook and welcomes them back every semester. I, I, I love that. I think that that's a great way to welcome back our students to make them feel as part of not only Ripon College, but the Ripon community. And oftentimes those two may be separated. So I know we have a lot of conversations here in terms of how can we bridge the community here at the college with the community outside. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity to do, to, to, to do that and to give access on both ends. I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you for putting the plug in for Jay's, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is the which the girls pride themselves and feel it's very important to be welcoming. Um, and I, because one of them is my daughter, I am very proud of her for, for, for just feeling that and feeling that it's very important that all people who walk through the door are treated respectfully and, um, and it's a very genuine feeling. So thank you for, for noticing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, Joan, we actually had Jay's today. Um, our student work, our student interns were able to choose any place in Ripon for a, catered, for a catered meal and they chose Jay. So it's, it's, it's even more of a plug. <laughs> Mary, what you were talking about, I, I think it's okay if people want to be together with people that they're comfortable with because we all have those family traditions and, and group things, but to respect the groups to understand why groups are doing that and and what you're talking about is a is carrying it to an extreme where people are just digging their heels in and saying i'm only going to associate with people that are just like me and think like me but it's it's okay if people of color say and i came from an area of central florida where the next county south of us osceola county is is almost all hispanic of different you know different level different groups of hispanic people and they had their traditions and they did things differently and it was beautiful. And yet it's okay to, to have that and respect that as long as you understand it, you know, as, as a person who's not Hispanic to say, wow, those traditions are really cool. I may not be a part of them, but I respect that group to have them and I, I honor them. 
So I don't know, I guess maybe to soften the, I, I know like my husband's Italian and he remembers that, you know, the, the expression Italians need not apply. And what you were talking about, Cindy, about coming from other countries from Europe. I mean, they're, the Irish went through this, the Italians went through this, Polish, pe Polish people are always going through this. You know, it's just, we, we need to kind of break all those things down, but, and yet respect the differences, respect the traditions, because they're, they're so beautiful. So. You know, as we worked on the- One example, just real quickly, one example, and then I'll, then I'll be quiet. I'm sorry, I talk a lot. In Osceola County, because a lot of the malls were failing, you know, the traditional malls, like the one in Fond du Lac, which we just noticed was being torn down, I guess. But anyway, the, the Hispanic community there turned the malls into a family gathering place where there was recreation and there was areas where they could have family parties. And they, they brought some of these malls that were dying back to reflect what was important to that particular community. Now, for me, that may not have been that important, but in that particular area, that was very important for a place for these people to go and share their culture with other people who appreciated their culture. So just, just an example of what, what can happen in an area to kind of revive economically something that was dying and it also embraced the culture. Not, I'm quiet now. When we were working on the election, um, as we we found that we were astonished at some of the differences of perspectives among people that we talked with. And what we found is that the people who have no other experience than just being here in Ripon, and there are many of them, can't imagine what anyone else's life is like or can't imagine that someone who's different can be someone who is interesting and safe to be with, et cetera. And I know when I worked at Moraine Park, and Cindy, you may have experienced this too, but um, we found our students, many of them had never left Fond du Lac County. And it's very difficult to imagine anyone else's point of view if you haven't if not traveled a bit, read widely, or met people from other cultures. And I found that people are afraid of people who have different ways of thinking and different ways of doing things. Whereas with more, the people with more education tend to find people with differing backgrounds interesting and exciting to get to know. And not everybody does, but more so. And I think it's, it's scary when you think about how many people have never seen much beyond the boundaries of Fond du Lac County or maybe up north in Wisconsin to go hunting. I don't know how we deal with that. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> It is complex. However, I am just going to put this out there. I think that even reading and traveling doesn't give you a pass for understanding people of color. It can give you the opportunity to be in with people of color. That building community, learning narrative, spending time, continuous time, engaging in difficult conversations is one way of continuing to support people of color. There are a lot of people who think I've traveled, you know, I travel every summer to do a service trip, a service learning trip somewhere around the world. That still does not guarantee you a full picture of the community that lives there, right? Because it's still very diverse and it's still uh, very com complex, especially in different countries where there are dictatorships, where there are uh, different systems of power, um, different economies, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I think that, yes, then I agree that more study abroad programs need to be built in into our communities, more opportunities for exchange students 
We have 15 international students here at Ribbon. They each have a home away from home host. Um, I think Jolene, you're one of the hosts for our students and uh, Mandy is too. And I think that those are then opportunities where you break bread, you know, more consistently with our students and, um, and you learn more about them. Some of our students are even engaging their parents now with their hosts and things like that. And I think that that's a very rich and necessary experience on both ends. Um, so there is no answer to it. I, I think that it's just definitely education, but a continued sharing of community uh, effort, um, space, uncomfortableness, and just learning about each other. Intersectionality says that we may like the same music and we may not even know it. You know, my parents probably love some of the music you all love. I love probably some of the music you all, the same movies. We have so many commonalities and we're often just focusing perhaps on those differences. We perhaps have more commonality than, you, than we think. And so I think that that's where we can also begin to look, look at ourselves as well, to build community. I think probably uh, unless somebody else has additional questions, we should thank, thank Maria. And, and Rachel. I propose that we take ourselves off mute quick and, and do or go like this with your hands and do a hand. <laughs> oh, strange times during this online, but I hope our all of you are presenters. Maria, Saron, uh, Rachel, Daniela, I hope that you felt our genuine. Oh, Janice, is, 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 can you put Janice on mute, please? Uh, our, our genuine interest in wanting to learn more. And I will share with you, or we will uh, have an email. Leilani has already uh, requested to be able to have the PowerPoint shared out. And so Maria, thank you so much for putting that together for us. Um, that will also include your contact information. Um, Judy, I know that you are ready and willing to take all the names of, of the folks here that are interested. Um, I know that when you when we put out the email, we'll also put out a request that you can join uh, and, and let you know in that way. Um, we also have many other members of the league that couldn't be here tonight, and I, I bet that they would be interested in joining as well. I will also say in the wider community, there have been some folks that have been talking about how we can continue the conversation related to this as well. So I think the league, other community members, and also with the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, I'm just really I'm excited to keep this conversation going. So thank you for helping us further this tonight. Um, I'll let uh, Rich and Cindy now sort of take it, uh, take this back. But again, I just want to thank all of you for joining in this rich discussion and time for us to learn and to reflect on where we can go from here. Thank you everyone for um, participating and sharing this evening. Our members of the League of Women Voters of the Ripon area, which is actually broad, right? Judy Harris <laughs> goes beyond Ripon. Um, we do need to, um, our, our League of Women Voters of the Ripon area does need to come to consensus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So in the new year, we will be working towards that. So thank you, everyone. Bye. Our, our, Rich, our next us. event. Do you want to share our next event? Our lively issues. Yeah, we do have lively issues, which is coming up. Let me grab the calendar. That would be January sixteenth. And uh, on your calendar card, it it shows it being at the Congregational Church but it's going to be a Zoom meeting as well. In all likelihood. Yes, and unless miracles happen quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we, we can have good conversation use, using Zoom as a vehicle. So more information will come out regarding that. Basically, Lively Issues is where we discuss 
the positions that the local league has, that the national league has, the state league has, and then discuss what, what we would like to do as a group in the coming year. So it's an important uh, meeting to get input from everybody. We'll be in the midst of working with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if that's something that we wanna to continue to dis discuss that, it can be brought up at that time as well. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. This was wonderful. Yeah. Have a happy Thanksgiving and holiday season. You too. Everyone yes. stay well. <laughs> I'm an <-ality>. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.